about sin and salvation. And the way I want to do that is to use the church at Corinth. Now, you need to get your Bibles. You don't need it in the first three minutes, five minutes of this lesson. But, uh, but if you don't have a Bible, grab one of those. I, I remember being at a place where the preacher would say, everybody hold up your Bible. And I'm not going to do that right now. But we're trying more and more to put fewer and fewer verses on the screen to encourage people to open the Bibles. And when I say, look at this passage and look at that passage, I want to hear some pages rattle. I really want to, because I want there to be some indication of the fact that you're there. And, and uh, I know that some of you are already getting better and better about taking your pen and making notes in your Bible. Folks, you're just not that smart. If I have to write it down on notes like this, I guarantee you, you're not going to take it home unless you write it down somewhere. That les this lesson's not that good. No, you don't have to say amen to that. But this lesson is not so good that you're going to remember every aspect of it. And it just it thrills my soul to see everybody, individuals, using the Bible. I want to talk about the city of Corinth. Let me introduce Corinth to you. We'll come to some verses in Acts chapter eight, uh, 18 in a minute. But let's look at the, an introduction of the city of Corinth. Look at where Corinth is on the map. If, if you'll look at, the, look at that map of, uh, of, uh, of Corinth, you'll, you'll see the location of it. You see the Roman world that's there? It's right in the middle of it, isn't it? You, 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 look, over, uh, you, you, you look over to the, to the left side of the screen, over to the east, and there's Israel, and there's Turkey, and there's Iran, and Iraq, and Syria, and Babylon, and there are all of these cities. And then you look over to the west, and there's the, there is Rome, the capital of the world, and sitting right in the middle of the, of the Greek world is, is, is Corinth. Now look carefully at that map. Do you see how narrow that land is right where the, arrow, the tip of that arrow points to where Corinth is located? That may not mean a lot to us, but in the shipping that was done in the commerce of, the, of that ancient world, that little strip of land was, was amazing because all of the riches coming out, 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 of, out of modern day Turkey and Asia Minor, instead of having to go south in that treacherous water south of, uh, uh, of, of, of Greece and Achaia, they, they could just come to that little strip of the land and it was such an, ad, such an advantage to them that they would literally, of the smaller ships, pull the ship on board shore and then pull the ships nearly four miles all the way across that little band of land that was there. And that's interesting. There's a modern canal that is there. It's called the Corinthian Canal. It, uh, uh, Nero himself tried to dig this, by, by the way, when the Jerusalem fell in A.D. 70, he took 60,000 captives from Jerusalem. You need, need to understand, when Jerusalem fell, 1.1 million people died inside the city in A.D. 70. And the 60,000 that survived, many of them went over to Corinth to dig this canal. And what you're looking at is, uh, is the modern canal that is, they were actually unsuccessful in doing it. But you look at that canal that's there and you look at the, the height of it, it's 259 feet high, it's, it's four miles in length, it's 80 feet wide, and, and the depth of it is 20, 26 feet. And so they were really trying to dig a canal there because Corinth, and here's the whole point, was such a magnificent, important commercial city. It's a seaport town. Now when you think of a seaport town, what do you think of? Well, you think, of, uh, you think of the vice that's there, do you not? You know, we talk about what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. It would be another way of saying And the ruins of the city are still there, by the way. It, it's a magnificent city to go and to visit and, and, and to walk down the very place that, that Paul walked down. The very streets that were there. Unlike Jerusalem, when one goes to Jerusalem, the streets you walk down there are actually 15 feet above the streets Jesus walked down because of all of the destruction of that city and, and, and the rubbish and, and ruins of the city have built up. And so if you, if you walk down the Via Della Rosa in Jerusalem today, you're 15 feet taller than Jesus was when He walked down it because of the ruins. Of, but that's not true of Corinth. You walk down the very, very street that, that Paul walked down. You can see the very temples that Paul saw, although they were magnificent temples in his day. You want to look up on the hillside there? You see that mountainous outcropping that, that overlooks the city? It was called the Acropolis. Normally we think about the Acropolis being in Athens, 
for there was one, but there, there was this Acropolis that was there in Corinth. And I say all of this because it becomes vital in our understanding of, of the lesson for us to recognize that there was this outcropping of rock. Every time I look at this, I think of Stone Mountain in Atlanta. I don't know what you think of whenever you see the, that type of thing, but there's this mountainous area that was over the city. And, uh, and, and on the top of this mountain was a temple where there were 1,000 uh, priestesses who were there for the express purpose of worshiping pagan deity by committing fornication with any man that would come to the temple. Now, you stop and put that in, 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 in the reality and recognize that the church is in this place or we will be in this place, but it was a great, great honor for a woman to be able to, to be one of these priestesses. And, and the noble women of the city volunteered their service that they might go and serve their gods because it was not fornication just for fornication's sake. It was fornication and worship of the deity that was there. And that's what Corinth looked like before the gospel got there. Now you think about the darkness in that city that was there. Got your Bibles? Look at, look at Acts, chapter, Acts chapter 18, because it's in this chapter that we're going to read about Paul as, as he arrives there in that city. You look back in 17, you remember what happens in 17? That's the Sermon on Mars Hill, and the fact that, that uh, there's not a lot of great response in Athens. And so Acts chapter 17, verse 33, Paul departed from among them, and there were some who joined with them, and then mentions uh, particularly Dionysius, the Areopagite, who evidently was one of the rulers of the Acropolis that was there, or some individual associated with it. And there's a noble woman, and, and there are others with them that become, become Christian. Paul goes down to Corinth. And when he arrives in the city, he finds some people there, and you may recognize these names of Aquila and Priscilla. You see that in verse 2? They become Christians, evidently, not because Paul is there. Not, but not when, uh, they become Christians because Paul is there. They're not Christians when he, when he arrives there, but they're, they're tent makers. And Paul was a tent maker, and so he stayed with them. And he goes into the synagogue in, in verse 4 and reasons in the synagogue every Sabbath day. And, uh, but they opposed him. Look at verse 6. They blasphemed, they shook their garments and said, you ble uh, but when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said, your blood be upon you. We are leaving this Jewish synagogue and we're going to go out into this pagan city and see what we can do to impact this city. All of this immorality and this ungodly, can you imagine? Can you imagine what Paul was like when every place he looked was immorality? You couldn't walk out the streets without, without seeing that Acropolis that was there dominating your mind and dominating your, everything that you would see. It was a vile, vile port city. And evidently Paul was in some trouble because look at verse 9. The Lord spake to Paul that night in a vision that says, Paul, don't be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent for I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you for I have many people in this city. And so Paul gets there and he starts to preach. Look in verse, verse, uh, uh, verse 8. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogues, believed on the Lord with all of his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Now that's interesting in and of itself because it tells you somewhat about the kind of preaching that Paul did in that city. Look at, he goes in the cities, in the synagogue, then he gets out among the people, those Gentiles that are there, and he starts preaching to them, and the results of it, they hear it, they believe it, and they're baptized. Now, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I know on the screen we don't have the words 1 Corinthians, there's one room to put it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, look, look, look at the verses that are there. Got there? 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, uh, turn there. And look at Paul says, Now when I arrived there, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's amazing, isn't it? 
So Paul, Paul goes into the city, he gets out among the Gentiles, and his determination is, I only want to know Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now look over in chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians, this time chapter 15, verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached unto you, which, I also, or which you also received and which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He was buried, verse 4. He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, Paul said, when I got here, here's what I did. I was talking about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And here is what I preached. I preached the gospel to you about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. And sometimes individuals say, well, that's what the world needs. We need, we need to preach the gospel. And some of these doctrinal things, they'll say, ought never ever to be mentioned. But there must be a relationship between preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified and the relationship between the death and the burial of the resurrection of Jesus and the fact that when that kind of preaching is done, individuals are baptized. Sometimes, we, sometimes individuals say, why do you ever mention baptism? Oh, why don't you just get them to talk about Jesus? Well, I want to preach like Paul does. Isn't that the kind of preacher that you want in this church? The one that will get up and, and to say, I've determined to preach to you the whole counsel of God. And so he arrives in the city and he gets out among the people and he preaches the gospel to them. But what is the gospel? Sometimes individuals do not recognize that the gospel consists of facts. Jesus is the Son of God. You know, whenever we talk about the plan of salvation, we talk about that with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, and that individual says, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They are acknowledging the acceptance of facts. And if I ask you how, do you, how do you know Jesus is the Son of God? Here's where you'll have to go. Here are the facts of the gospel. But there's more to the gospel because there are commands to be obeyed. Sometimes individuals want to talk about, uh, only talk about, well, the goodness of Jesus and what a loving person He is and oh, how we need to understand the goodness of our, of our Savior. But we need to understand that someday He's going to say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I tell you to do? Luke chapter 6, verse 46. You see, you, you, we've got to obey, and so there are commands that are to be obeyed. In the Bible, Romans chapter 6, verse 16 and eight, or 17 and 18 says that when we obeyed from the heart the form of the doctrine delivered to us, we were then made free from sin. And that freedom from sin leads us to the third aspect of the gospel, and that is promises to be enjoyed. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There are promises that, that, are, are, the, that, that, that are to be enjoyed. And so as you think about Paul's preaching in that city and you think about the preaching of the gospel, understand there are facts and there are commands and there are promises that are involved. Now then, when he got out into the city, people obeyed the gospel. Most amazing thing that happened in a city that was so immoral, so immoral that, that, that when an individual became the most wicked individual, immoral individual, the Roman world used the expression, he's been Corinthianized. That's amazing, isn't it? Corinthianized. What does that mean? It means that here is the most wicked, one of the most wicked cities in the world, and when you become unbelievably wicked, you have been Corinthianized. And that's the way it was. You got your Bible? Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, this time beginning in verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. And just because some of you probably don't have your Bible, I put this one on the screen. I want you to look at it carefully. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9 says, I wrote unto you in my epistle not to keep company. Well, I'm wrong. Uh, chapter 6 verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? He's in this immoral city. And instead of getting up just talking about how good Jesus is, he gets up there and he says, folks, Corinthians, here's what I, you need to understand. You, you must understand this. This is a matter of knowledge 
that the ungodly shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't deceive yourself. And then he begins this catalog of sins. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, none of them shall in, uh, will inherit the kingdom of God. He didn't follow, the, what was that book written many years ago about how to win friends and influence people? He went out and he saw where people were and he preached the message of God to them and look at the immorality that was there. I want to ask you something. How much does that differ from America? You look at that catalog of sins and you tell me how much it differs from America. You think about what's in the news uh, this very day. You talk about the, the laws that's been passed in New York State and the hundreds of individuals standing in line after midnight to get married. But look at the last word that's there, and that is the word covetousness. And the news this morning says the state of New York stands in, in commerce that will be brought in by this one legislation to profit $200 million. And the love of money is the root of what? You know that verse. But look at how, look at how vile the city was. How vile the city was. And yet look at verse 9, or verse 11. And the way I've got it highlighted on the screen, if I were going to mark my Bible, I would highlight that word were. Such were some of you. You know what that says? It says God can forgive anybody on this earth. I don't care what your sin is. God will forgive you of every wrong you've ever done in your life. Such were some of you, and if you've got your Bible open, you look and he says, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. God's Holy Spirit, through the preaching of Paul, the sword of the Spirit was there, and it cut them to their hearts. And they used to be fornicators, and they used to be idolaters, and they used to be homosexuals, and, and, and they used to be vile in all of these other sense of, of other words that are there. And he says, it is no longer true because when you became a child of God, you were washed in the blood of Jesus. That's amazing, isn't it? Those who are in my class uh, Wednesday night, Carter was there, little, how old's Carter now? Three weeks, a month, something like that? Five weeks? Little baby? How many sins does little Carter have? Zero. And when these folks in Corinth became Christians, God saw them in the purity of a little, Car little Carter. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? I don't know why He'd forgive us. I don't know what we have to offer to Him. All of our righteousness is His filthy rags. And yet, they became Christians. And that's what repentance involves. Those who, who were fornicators, sexually immoral, stopped being sexually immoral. And those who were living in adulterous situations changed. And those who were homosexuals changed. And those who were idolaters changed. And those who were drunkards changed because that's the power of the gospel to transform the lives of individuals. And what America needs is a transformation of the lives and the souls of, of the people in this land by the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That they might be washed, look, look at those words, washed, sanctified, justified. I don't know about you, but I might mark my Bible and circle all three of those words to talk about. Here's what happens when you're saved. I'm washed in the blood. I'm sanctified. I'm set apart. And I am proclaimed as being just 
by the judge of the world. He justifies me and he forgets every wrong that I've ever done. Guess what happened? Guess what happened in Corinth? Oh, the church was established. But there were some folks in the church who didn't want to, who repented of their repentance, if that makes sense. Here they were, walking in this way, being evil and vile, and the gospel changed, and they repented. You know what repentance means? It means you change. It means you turn around. And so they were washed, they were justified, they were clean, they, they were children of God. And guess what they did? They repented of their repentance and went back to living that kind of vile life. Look back in chapter 5. We're spending the rest of our time in chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, because it shows how the people in Corinth dealt with sin in the church. Verse 1, It is reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. Now I want you to tell me what could be more vile than that list of sins we've just read. But in the church at Corinth, the situation had developed where there was an individual who had repented of their repentance. What What had he done? The Bible said that a man had taken his father's wife. And there's controversy about this as to whether that might have been a stepmother But even as you read about that ancient world, a man marrying his stepmother was known among the Gentiles and oftentimes approved, even among the rulers of the kings and the Caesars. It's possible that we're talking about an incestuous kind of situation, at least possible. Because what had happened in Corinth was not even named among the Gentiles. The Gentiles, the most wicked city on earth, would not do it. Guess what? In the church there at Corinth, there is this kind of situation. What are you going to do about it? How does God expect those who are living righteous and want to go to heaven and see the beauty of the church... How how does God want to work this thing out? Well, the easiest way, the easiest way, look at verse 2. The easiest way is to talk about how loving and gracious and receiving we are. We are such good folks that we'll accept anybody and you can come in and live any way and be on the church roll and live any lifestyle that you want to and we perhaps will even make you a Bible class teacher or ordain you to some office or something. We We will make you a part of... You know what happened at Corinth? Instead of being grieved that the most grievous sins that that could ever be imagined was right there in the church, they were puffed up about it. Folks, a person whose grace is greater than the grace of God is not gracious at all. And yet they'd accept it. He said, you should be grieving about it. You should be mourning about this. Look at verse 2. You're puffed up and have not rather mourned. You see, the Bible talks about how you deal with sin. You know Matthew 18. Somebody's doing wrong. You've got ought against a brother. What are you to do? Well, you tell everybody on the earth. You call everybody in the church and say, let me tell you what brother so-and-so is doing, what sister so-and-so. Let me tell you what she said. No, no. Matthew chapter 18 says, if there's, you've got ought against somebody, you go and you talk to them personally. Look at 18, Matthew 18, 15 to 16. Don't leave 1 Corinthians though. You just go and talk to them. Try to solve this matter. And then if it cannot be resolved one on one, take one or two witnesses with you and try to work this thing out and try to seek, seek the count. Here's the Bible. The Bible says it in this way. If any is overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. When you think about the very work of elders, shepherds in the church, you know what the work of a shepherd is? Is not to just stay among the ninety and nine who need no repentance, but there is that sheep that has wandered away. 
Go find that individual, not just elders, but those of us who are spiritual have an obligation to those who are weak to try to bring them back. We're family. If you had a child that wasn't showing up at the dinner table, would you be concerned about it? But what about that brother or sister who doesn't show up at the Lord's table? who has become a child of God. You see, at one time they were walking away from the Lord and and, and they became Christians. They repented. They turned their life over to the Lord and now Satan has worked in their hearts and they've turned back going the other way. They were those individuals who were once a part of the kingdom of God. This man at Corinth had repented, and then he repented of his repentance. And you cannot just ignore sin if you're going to be Christ church. Folks, we don't need to lie to everybody with a sign out here saying this is the church of Christ when we're not going to do what Christ says needs to be done. So here's the church in Corinth. Paul, what, what, what are you going to do about that situation in Corinth? Here's Paul says, I'm absent from you. Verse 3, in my body, but my heart and my soul is there. And while you may be puffed up, I'm grieving. I've already made a judgment about what should be done. Here's what you do. In the name of the Lord Jesus, probably you ought to underline that in in, in your Bible. In my Bible, because it's on the same page that that, uh, chapter 6, verse 11 is, I might draw a line between you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know what happened when one became a child of God? In the name of Jesus Christ, they were cleansed of their sins. By that kind of authority. Now then, in the name of the Lord Jesus, deal with this individual who has turned his back on the Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus, gather together, along with my spirit, I'm going to be there, not physically, but my soul will be there. And with the the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan. Why? To get rid of him? And hear this. This is not that which is popularly called excommunication to try to get rid of someone. Deliver such a one to Satan. For the destruction of this, of the of, of his fleshly desires, the destruction of his flesh, that his soul might be saved. Go back to our visual illustration. He was away from the Lord. He was walking in the footsteps of Satan. He was living like everybody else in the world lives, and all of a sudden he becomes a child of God. He repents. Now he's walking in the footsteps of Jesus. It's what would Jesus do? I'm going to live right. I'm going to do right. I'm going to, I'm going to do right. And then all of a sudden, Satan gets a hold of him and he's, where is he? Well, he's still coming to church, evidently in this situation in Corinth. And Paul says, you give him back to the devil. Why? Why? To get rid of him? No, a thousand times no. But in order that that he may may, may be brought to a realization of what's happened to him. Here are the redeemed of the Lord. Here are those following in Jesus' name. They're washed, they're sanctified. They're the church of Jesus Christ. They want to go to heaven. They want to live right. But that man said, I don't have any desire to do that. When every other aspect of restoration could ever be brought about, when people have talked to him, when he's been encouraged to live right and to do right, give him back to the devil. How do you do that? You destroy 
fleshly ties with him. Look in verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Here's this brother in the church at Corinth, and, and he's living immorally. Now you said, wait a minute, hang on. I am not talking about those who are sexually immoral out on the streets of Corinth. I'm not talking about those who are not Christians. I certainly did not mean the sexually immoral people of this world or the covetous or the extortioners or the idolaters since you'd have to go out of the world. But if there's a brother, verse 11, I've written to you to keep, not to keep company with anyone who is a brother who is sexually immoral, covetous, idolater, revilers, drunken, drunk, uh, drunkard, or an extortioners, not even to eat with such a person. Why? Because you hate him? Because you want to get rid of him? No, a thousand times no. Because you want to shock him into the realization that the kingdom of God, the family of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, is withdrawing from you to excommunicate you, no, a thousand times, no, but to cause you to repent and cause you to come back. There was a book written entitled, The Forgotten Commandment. The Forgotten Commandment. Do you know how painful it is for the family of God to ever be involved in anything like this? I sat once in a room where an elder voted to withdraw from his own daughter because of the way she was living. You know how painful that is? Oh, yes. But folks, if we're going to be a church of Christ, We've got to do right. And it's always right to do right. It's always wrong to do wrong. It's never right to do wrong and never wrong to do right. There's one rule. Do what's right. You know what will happen? What if the church in Corinth had not taken action against this brother? How much light would there have been in the city of Corinth shining from the church of Christ in that city? How much light would there have been? Here's the pagan world. Now, if you really, really want to get Corinthianized, go over and become a part of the body of the family of God, the body of Jesus. Because they do things over there that would not even be done by the by the most pagan of the pagan. But it's amazing again, it's not just the sexual immoral. Look back at verse 10 when he begins to talk about covetous and extortioners and people of that nature. How much light would there have been in the city? There'd been no light. Well, wait a minute. Wonder if there are some other people who want to live immoral lives and still be religious. Where could they go? Why? I'll tell you where you can go. And that is you can go over here and become a part of the church of Christ in Corinth because we'll accept anybody. We're the most loving folks on earth. And that's why Paul says, he says, brethren, you're, look at verse 6. Your glorying is not good. This concept of accepting anybody in any situation, your glorying is not good. Don't you know? that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And there's no light in Corinth if the church at Corinth does not deal with this situation. Guess what? They dealt with it. We don't have time to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2 that said the man repented and came back and served God. And guess what? 
Just like when that prodigal came home, Paul says to that, though to the church at Corinth, this brother that, that's no longer with his father's wife, that has, has, has repented of the repentance a third time, and now he's living a godly life, encourage him, receive him, embrace him. He's back. The prodigals come home. And I thank God. I thank God for an eldership in this church who is as painful as it is, stands for what's right. You see, if the salt, you're the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing. And had Corinth not done what Paul said, the Bible describes him as being good for nothing. Folks, God wants us to be holy. Let's live holy lives. Let's love this table. Let's love this worship of God. And let's love this book. We sang, give me the Bible. And that fourth verse, Jerry, I don't know if I've ever felt the impact of the words any greater than this morning. When it says, the light of life immortal, hold up this beside the open grave. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is meaningless without a devotion to doing what's right. God help us. God help us to be like the church in Corinth. Oh, not like the one that got puffed up about evil, but like the church that heard the words of God and did something about it. Of all the lessons I preach, this is the most painful. I hate preaching on this topic. But I love a God. I love a God who sees the purity and the salt and the light aspect of the church that says do something about it. And in that sense, it's a part of preaching the whole counsel of God. And there's nothing that brings more joy than preaching the whole counsel of God. God help us. We talked about the folks in Corinth. They were washed, cleansed, and sanctified. You know, that can happen to you today. They, they heard Paul's preaching and they believed it. Mark chapter 16, verse 16 said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Paul arrived in Corinth and they believed it. Did they repent? Oh, yes. Acts 18, it was in Corinth. Acts 17, the Bible says that God now commands all men everywhere to repent. And then they confess the name of Jesus. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, If you do it, you'll be saved. And then they were baptized. We've got Acts 2.38 that says, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. What about Acts 22.16 uses the word washed when it's talking about being washed in the blood of Jesus. What are you waiting on? Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on His name. You could do that today. You know, Shannon did that just a, a couple of weeks ago after our Sunday morning service. You could do it right now. You could come down this aisle when, as we sing this invitation and be saved by the powerful blood of Jesus. And when you do this, guess what? The Lord will add you to the church, to His family. And you, you, you'll be a part of the family of God. Live right, do right, be faithful unto death, and the crown of life awaits you. How can we help you this day? 
Won't you let it be known by coming to the front right now as together we stand and sing.